praise the Lord. Let's give God a hand of praise this day. Amen. Let's all stand as we begin this morning. It's good to see everybody. If you're visiting with us today, we appreciate you being here, and we welcome you to God's house. Father, today, Lord, we want to give you praise and honor and glory for everything you've done for us this day and throughout this week, Lord. And Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning in your presence, Father, Lord. And we just want to sing praise unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I want to be standing by your side Holding your hand So let your kingdom come Let it live in me This is my prayer This is my plea Let the worshipers things I don't want to let go of. Amen. When I love him, I've got to love him with my entire, my whole heart. Right. And we're going to rise. Can you just imagine? Can you see it? Can you think of it? Millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people are rising to worship the King. Amen. And, and what a day that the next song is perfect. What a day that will be. I cannot imagine. Oh 
Amen. I'll let you be seated just a moment. I'm going to share a few prayer concerns with you. If you happen to pick up a copy when you came in this morning, uh, everything, almost everything, let me say, I share is going to not be on that copy. Some are. Uh, Jimmy and Francis Cribs, so good to see you this morning, okay? Uh, continue to pray for them. Tom Humphreys, uh, Brother Tom uh, goes back uh, to the doctor this week. Keep him in prayer. Nona and Farrell McLeod uh, having some things there. Also, uh, Hope Spikes has uh, some surgery this week. Be prayerful for her as well. And uh, some names that are not there that we have shared uh, are not on the bulletin, but we have been sharing. Art is absent this morning, having a few issues again with uh, the foot, so pray for Art. He's probably watching us even as we worship. Uh, Cassandra Wolf, uh, Jerry Harris, uh, Marion Henderson, uh, Shirley. Uh, also, if I can read my writing now, Warren McNeese, we've been praying for him for a few weeks now. Uh, Albert and Patsy Hersey, John Jones. Shane O'Neill, I was given that name a few days ago, Preston and Sheila, Kenny Taylor, Lisa Festerman, uh, there's one I don't recognize, I couldn't read that part. Misty had had a seizure, she said, asked that y'all be prayerful for her, and uh, she is unashamed to ask for prayer, so thank the Lord. Uh, she's doing well, she's behind us here, so continue, if you would, to pray for her. Uh, Cassandra Wolf, if I hadn't already said that, as well as Sherry Mora, okay? Anyone else uh, before we pray? Ushers, you can be coming forward, okay, as uh, we get ready to pray. Anyone else? Who's that? Jimmy Smith, okay. Okay, if you did not get that, Jimmy Smith, okay? Well, let's pray together. Lord, we're reminded that the tithe is the Lord's. Lord, thank you for your provision in all of our lives. Lord, sometimes we may focus on what we don't have, but Lord, give us a moment to praise you for what we do have. Lord, you have blessed us uh, beyond measure. And you tell us uh, this is one of the areas in our life that we can trust you and try you. And Lord, those of us who, uh, who are there and have tried you over time, we know that you're faithful. Lord, every name that we called has, a, has probably some affiliation to some of the members here, those of us who worship. And Lord, we pray, believing God, that you will meet their need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We believe, Lord, that the victory is ours because of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. So we plead the blood now on every life, every family, Lord, for protection as well as provision. And Lord, might you continue to get all of the honor and all of the glory for all of these things. Praising you, Lord, is our blessing today to be able to do. And we praise you now in Jesus' sweet name. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this offering that you've collected today. We want to thank you, Lord, for letting it be used for your glory and your purpose in your church. In your loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, got the little guys. I'm sorry, Gabe. Suffer the little children to come unto me.
Thank you, thank you so much. If you're visiting with us today, let me take the opportunity to thank you for being here. I trust that something will be said or done today that will bless you and likewise cause you or challenge you to want to be back with us at some other opportunity, okay? It's always a joy to see people uh, that are new. Now, I think many of you are all news because I don't know everybody's name. So it's good to see the others move around, though, and welcome those of you uh, who may be visiting. Take your Bibles, if you would. Uh, two scriptures I'd like you to put place there. Uh, one of them is in the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? Uh, I'll be reading from chapter 3, reading a few verses. Uh, and then likewise, we'll look at Matthew chapter 9 in a few minutes, okay? So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and then we'll look at chapter 9 of Matthew in a few moments. Let me remind you, because I will probably forget it at the end of the service, a, a wedding shower this weekend uh, uh, from 12 to 2 in the fellowship hall for Caleb Whitaker and Caleb uh, Carly Whitaker, I'm sorry, and Caleb Wilson. So uh, there's an announcement in the bulletin on that today. And we would truly, truly invite you to support these two as they're preparing for their marriage, okay? Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, something tells me uh, that I have read these verses before here, but not preached on them. And I feel led to read them again this morning because I want to share with you some thoughts about uh, where we think we may be, but also where the Lord knows that we need to go, okay? Uh, the Lord's uh, counsel is always what we're in desperate need of. Now, uh, you might have already arrived, but I'm still in need of that, okay? Why? Because God uh, gives faithful instruction. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 1, we begin by seeing these uh, words. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Uh, I researched this one day. I was curious as to uh, that phrase, a time to, okay? In our lives, we all have certain times, or let me say, uh, consider certain times. They may not be exact. They can be within a range of 30 minutes or so. But many of us uh, have particular habits that we do uh, uh, almost uh, just simply by our internal clock, I call it, okay? Well, our life is very similar to that, and if we would begin to try to chronicle our life up to the time that we begin to have uh, memory, whether you were two when you began to remember things, or four, uh, I'm not really knowing where you were. However, uh, we have been through a lot of times, have we not, over our particular lives. But what I discovered when I looked uh, uh, at that phrase, I discovered you can find it no less than 27 times, okay? Now, with that in mind, uh, you, you know, uh, Esther, was it not, said for such a time as this, uh, a little deviation from that that I read to you right there, but uh, everything that is happening is according uh, to not always our time, but it's definitely happening through the Lord's time, okay? If you don't believe that, you just watch the calendar. Tomorrow, there'll be another day. The calendar will change again. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm not following that calendar. Well, I have to because my bills come due according to that calendar. Uh, 
And I got a notice this week. I hadn't even told Debbie about it. A couple of days ago, I got a notice on my phone. It said, uh, by the way, you have eight more days before your power bill uh, is due. And I thought, I said, I, I know I paid that power bill about 10 days ago. And I looked back and I absolutely was right. But I paid it to the wrong account. Now, they would not have taken that for an answer, believe me. So I have duplicated that. And I paid it to the right account, okay? Well, with all of that said, uh, there is a time for everything, is there not? Amen. Sometimes we stop and we think about where the life of churches are. And having been doing uh, that for about uh, 43 years now of pastoring, we just knew certain times of the year certain things had to happen. And with that in mind, uh, there were other times that were not so specific, but we would generalize those times. And as a result of that, we have become familiar with uh, a calendar in the life of the church. You are sort of passing the baton a little bit now, you know. You've got the... Uh, you got the stewards meeting, you've had the deacons meeting, and next we'll have another meeting, and that'll perpetuate itself, uh, and it will keep revolving, okay? Well, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 37, he said, herein is that saying true, one sows, another reaps, uh, I sent you to reap where on you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you're entering into their labors, I have been uh, I have been sowing a lot of my life. Really, uh, I can't see the seed, but we ca we cast them, we scattered them. Some of that uh, surely has come to fruition over the years. Uh, but many of my, or much of my life, let me say, someone else had sowed, but I came in behind, uh, and there was a reaping. And as I reaped, I remembered, Lord. Uh, uh, here I am enjoying the fruits of other people's labors, okay? Why? Because even Paul would say to the Corinthians there in chapter 2 and 3 of 1 Corinthians, he would say, uh, one sows, another waters, uh, but who gives the increase? God does. So we have a farming mentality or an husbandman's mentality when it comes uh, to the life of the church and what we do. Now, I just remember that a uh, time too. Debbie got a text yesterday morning. Happened to be that uh, the grandson's uh, mom and dad were in Savannah seeing uh, our granddaughter who's going to give birth to our first great-grandchild in about three weeks. And the call was not anything about that. It was, uh, can we bring Chris over when we get home? He thinks he's got to go over every day. And he told his Nana, I think uh, I have this right. He told her, uh, or he told his parents that every day in the summer, he has to come to Nana's house. Now, what I'm going to believe is summer is a long season, okay? Uh, we love it, but uh, what I'm saying there is sometimes uh, seasons have a tendency to lap over, do they not? Now, you and I know that uh, if the Lord tarries, uh, uh, come, come the 21st of uh, next month, we're going to lap over into another what? Season, are we not? Now, that doesn't have anything to do necessarily uh, with planting and watering and harvesting. Now, there's certain things we won't plant in the fall. There's certain things we won't gather in the fall. There's certain things that uh, changes by the season. However, what I'm very familiar with is that life goes on through all of these seasons, does it not? Somebody's probably already sown their mustard greens. Somebody's already uh, maybe started that winter crop. And if you're a farmer, I'm sure uh, those cattle farmers, they have, uh, have already sown their winter rye. They're getting ready. Why? Because uh, the seasons bring different things uh, about us. Now, if we could relate that to church life, uh, those seasons roll around, do they not? There's a time of planting. You know, uh, uh, Kettle Creek's been planting for what? Over 150 years, I'm sure. The seasons have been rolling. They've been happening. Yes, people planting. Uh, I shared, well, when I transitioned last year, 
and I, I was sharing some thoughts with the church back then. I, I just had a recollection of people who had been instrumental uh, in our life during that season prior to 1998. And uh, I share with you, six people were on a search committee when we came to Waycross. Three of those have deceased already, which shouldn't, uh, which shouldn't alarm you. Why? Because that was 26 years ago now, or 27. But I'm saying that just to remind you that the planting season, okay, one thing about us that we must remember is that we must uh, transition the season. You've been through a tough season over the last few months, okay? I'm very familiar with that. I'm not saying that to, to, to bring harm uh, or to bring shame. It's time to cultivate the ground. It's time to plant the seed. It's time to move on, is it not? Why? Because, hey, uh, the harvest needs to happen. So when I think of that, there was a season of planting. But you know, also you learn from the farm, there was a season of plowing as well, was there not? I'm just using a little different word there, planting and plowing. Uh, you know, our life sometimes resembles a fresh tilled, uh, uh, tilled garden plot, does it not? Uh, when they put the harrow to it, or they turn back around and put the, put the uh, plow to it, Yes, and I'm talking about the deep plow, the, the turn plow that just really rolls that dirt over. And we say, oh man, there's certain seasons of my life that I'm really not uh, looking forward to. Or there's seasons of my life that I didn't enjoy. Well, friend, let me tell you that. I think we all have had some of those that were tougher than others. Amen? But the reality is uh, that the Lord has been faithful to bring another season, has He not? Now, with all of that in mind, the time is what we looked at. Yes, a, a specific period of time there, a specific length of time even there. And yes, we're transitioning and we're believing God's going to not only uh, allow us to plow and plant, but also there's a time of gathering yet that is futuristic, okay? During those plowing and planting times, uh, sometimes there's some things that happen, okay, if you look back at the past any length of time. I'm thinking about we have laughed together, we have cried together, we have rejoiced together. You know, church life is beautiful. It's not always easy. But you've got to remember, it's always beautiful. Why? Because it's in His time. I think I might have told you, I, I was not a real avid sports participator, but I played one sport, and that was football. Now, I know you look at me, and you say, you're too little for that. Uh, but I was one of the 22 at Patterson. Yes, 22 of us on a team that you had to have 11 on the field at the time. So if you know anything about that, that means all 60 minutes, some of us were there. We were on the field all the time. We participated. I love that sport. You say, why did you love it? Because you got your head knocked around? Well, I have an excuse now of why I am like I am. <laughs> Seriously. You know, me and my friend will go to lunch once in a while together, and he'll say, hey, and, hey man, do you remember those old Riddell helmets? And he'll remind me that there was nothing in there but hardly a strap or two, a little old pocket of uh, leather in the top of that. And he said, uh, we all have a reason for acting like we act, you know, after seeing the stars a few times. I like the sport. You know why I liked it? Because there were 11 of us on the field at the time. When we lost, we couldn't say, you lost that game. We had to say, we lost it. When we won and we celebrated, especially my, our senior year, we went 11 and 1. Only had 27 points scored on us in 11 games. You know what we said when it got over? We almost made it. One more game, we would have been state finalists. Friend, let me tell you about those times. Those times are gone. I often sleep at night and dream about some of those church experiences. I really do. I often think about those during the day as well because my wife and I, we've had some glorious experiences in the life of the church as we've lived. There was a well-known basketball coach retired in, 19, or retired in 20 and 21. 
Coach K, they called him at Duke. He said at the end of the 21-22 season, he nearly had a storybook ending to his career there. The Blue Devils reached the Final Four in the NCAA tournament, lost 81-77 to to arch rival North Carolina. Do we have any uh, blue fans here, I'll call it, light blue? But anyway, Coach K emphasized to them that he still loved the game at the end of his career. But he said, I just think I squeezed every bit of joy from that sponge. I think it was almost a year before he ever went to a basketball game. Some of you are like Coach K. You might have came through a piece of your life where you've squeezed almost all the juice out of that orange. But friend, you know, the beautiful thing about the Lord is He'll still renew us. We may not go back to where we were. Coach K's not coaching college basketball no more. Whatever your profession was before you retired, you'll probably never have to punch that clock again. But the reality is that it most likely is going on just that someone else is doing it. Now, when I said Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and I wanted to read that this morning, it said, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous or large, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Sometimes I watch some documentaries on TV. Whether they're harvesting blueberries or harvesting oranges in Florida or whether they might be picking sweet corn in uh, central Georgia or throwing watermelons, you know, around Cordell. There's one thing I know about the harvest and that it doesn't last forever. It has to pay, be paid attention to. Now, friend, with that in mind, Jesus said the harvest is great. In other words, while we're going through our transitions and our seasons and our time, the harvest has not ceased. Now, with that in mind, uh, you know, as I looked at that text, there were a few things that came to my mind. First of all, there's a great exasperation they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. That's the way Jesus saw the crowd. That's how he defines what he saw to us. One of my first uh, experiences of Kettle Creek. Now, I know you want to know my story. I had an elderly lady who was in Baptist Village call me about the year 2000. Now, do your quick math and you know that wasn't yesterday, okay? She wanted to know if I'd do her funeral. I said, yes, ma'am, I sure will. I'm glad you called. We talked about her life just a little bit, and I said, well, uh, ma'am, I said, I'd like to ask you something. Where are you going to be buried? You know, if you're going to die, we've got to bury you somewhere. She said, well, I'm going to be buried down at Kittle Creek. Now, you know if you're not from here, you call Kettle or Kittle or whatever, but she was an old, an old native, so she said, down at Kittle Creek. And she was living in the old apartments that you know they tore down because of asbestos and stuff. And I said, well, hey, yes, I'll put that on my calendar. I didn't ask her when she's going to go, but I just knew when I got the phone call, I'd be ready. But when I asked her, where are you going to be buried? She didn't just say Kittle Creek. She said, I'm going to be there, buried down at Kittle Creek. It's such a beautiful place. And it's really growing. She wasn't talking about the church. Don't get too big-headed. <laughs> she was talking about the graveyard. Can you imagine such hope? I'm going to be buried down there. It's so beautiful, and it is. And it's really growing. In my 24 or 5 years, no, 26 years or more in Waycross, that little area over there has really grown, hasn't it? Actually, in those periods of time, I've actually did some funerals over here on this side as well. I say all of that to say this. Jesus saw the crowd and he, saw, he had a great exasperation. He saw them as scattered people. 
basically needing a shepherd. He had a great explanation for the crowd as well. He said, the harvest is large. You know, you can measure harvest with any uh, uh, stick or spoon you want to, okay? Certain things, they measure harvest by the pound. Other things, they measure harvest by the bushel. Or other things, they measure harvest, uh, excuse me, in different ways. However, he just said it's large. He also said there's a great education. Pray you the Lord of the harvest. Jesus said if there's a harvest out there and there's a people that's wandering around like there's no shepherd, He said, I think it's time we get busy praying to the Lord of the harvest. Why? Because there's a great confirmation. He will send forth laborers into His harvest. With that in mind, let's remember something. He is the one that assigns the labors. But it's also, if you notice the word, it's His harvest. Sometimes we think it's uh, our harvest, or sometimes we think it's His job to do the harvest, or sometimes we think that, oh, you know, somebody else will do it. No, Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest. He'll send forth laborers, plural, into His harvest. How do we see people when we view them? I'm not going to ask you how do we call them or what do we call them. We might not want to repeat that here. But do we see them as sheep having no shepherd? Do we see them as lost having no direction? Do we see them as as hungry having no one to feed them? Let me tell you, the way we see people has a lot to do with the Harvest of the church as well. Yes, I've been guilty. Yes, probably you have. But the reality is still the same. Jesus would go about the cities and the villages, and He would teach in the synagogues. He would preach and heal. Why? Because He was moved with compassion. Someone asked one time, what is compassion? Best explanation I've ever heard is love in action. You know, you can watch a good movie on TV and you'll weep a little bit. You say, preacher, do you cry when you watch a movie? Well, I just get a little, I just get a little itchy eyes. But you know, sometimes we walk right by people in our town or on our block or and we, and we forget. My wife reminded me the other day, our neighbor next door to us, and she reminded me the other day that uh, I should have invited them to church. And she wasn't necessarily saying here or there. She just said, hey, those people need Jesus. There was a book that Henry Blackaby wrote once, and I don't know if you're familiar with Henry Blackaby. He died just recently, within the last year or so. And the book was titled, The Church Experiencing God Together. Henry Blackaby was known for a previous book that he had written back in the 90s, and I'm thinking 96 this year before. And that book was Knowing and Doing the Will of God. But this one is a sequel to that. And this one was entitled, uh, Your Church Experiencing God Together. That means the membership, Experiencing God Together. And he had six principles that uh, are chapters in that particular daily read-along study. And uh, he, he listed these, and let me share them with you quickly. Number one, the Holy Spirit will never work contrary to the Father's will. If you want to know if, if it's really the Spirit leading you or the Spirit leading the church, uh, just search the book. And if you find anything uh, that is contrary in the Bible to what you're seeing or hearing, remember, that's not of the Lord. People can tell you differing things. I heard a guy say one time, methods are many, principles are few, methods are always changing, principles never do. So the Lord or the Spirit will never work contrary to the Father's will. The Holy Spirit is never free to work where sin and unbelief is present. 
Now, folks, let's remember, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember, we have an advocate with the Father. Remember, the Spirit makes intercession for us. So, basically, hey, give that to the Lord. Get it under the blood. The Holy Spirit works where God's name is honored. Honestly, folks, remember, this is the Lord's house, okay? And when I say that, I mean you can talk in it, and you can hug in it, and you can shake hands, and whoo, you can even laugh in it. But it is the Lord's house. And if you want to come to the Lord's house, remember, He welcomes you here. Amen? He is quicker to welcome people to His house sometime than we are to invite them. However, He works where God's name is honored. God's name, as far as I know, is honored in this place. It has been for two and a half months that Debbie and I have been here, and I believe you will always do that. Why? Because uh, this is a place where we can experience God together. The Holy Spirit chooses to work through the local churches. I'm glad he doesn't limit himself to work here and ignore there. However, the reality is that God potentially uh, works in every local congregation that he might be glorified and the saints might be edified. And uh, the reasoning behind that is that he gets all the glory. But believe me, church, we get the good, don't we? I often tell people, I'm glad God don't give me what I deserve. But I'm glad His mercies are new every morning. Amen. The Holy Spirit's work in the churches is always God-sized. How often am I desirous to do something that I can do? How often do I say, God, give me something bigger than me? How often do we uh, line up and say, Lord, um, you know, that's just not enough. This is a God-sized moment, whether we believe it or not. Amen? We came to Second Baptist years ago, 98, and I told my wife, I might have told you already. I said, Debbie, if we were to go there and spend 10 years there, we'll bury 100 people in the first 10 years. I didn't see myself staying nowhere, but I didn't know, I, I didn't care if we did. Hey, we were 23 miles from our parents, so, you know, that would have been fine. Uh, we didn't quite bury 100 people in those 10 years, but we buried 80-something. Boy, that was God-sized. Really was. I told somebody the other day, I said, hey, the churches there and here are so similar. No, we don't bear 100 people if we stayed here that long. I'm just saying that the similarities, though, are very similar, which we'll address quickly in a moment. The Holy Spirit's work in the church is God-sized, and when the Holy Spirit works in a church, He always brings honor and glory to God. Aren't you glad we're not worried about who gets the glory today? Hey, it's all right to compliment somebody for a good job. It's all right to praise somebody who maybe sings a Christ-honoring song. It's fine. Please do it. But remember, all the glory belongs to our Lord. I want to give you a few quick things now where I see us or you going, okay? Acts 1.8 said, Tarry ye here in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Lord, I can't do that because I'm not going to fly over there. No, he didn't say go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria. He's saying to us right here, he said, take your surrounding neighborhood first. He said, then reach out beyond that, and maybe it's the county or the city. Beyond that, it'll be the state, and beyond that, it could be the continent. He just said, start where you are. Let me tell you, folks, we need to embrace the territory, do we not? Back when I was a kid growing up in church, and even into my youth years, uh, grew up in a uh, little church outside of Patterson, and, you know, I, I, we always tried to figure out where our boundaries ended. I got wise one day and I said, the Lord don't have boundaries. You got boundaries on a football field or a basketball court, but you don't have boundaries in church life. 
It's open game. I didn't say that. Everybody needs to be reached for Jesus. Friend, let me tell you, we are not in competition with the other churches. Why? Because, hey, Jesus said the field is white in the harvest. He didn't say that that little territory over there, that little territory over there. He said, go ye therefore in Acts 1.8. Now, my philosophy of that is as you go, be witnesses. Where you are going, be witnesses. You don't have to stop them in the Kroger aisle and pull out your Schofield Bible and beat them on the head. But you can be a witness, can't you? Hey, claim the territory, folks. Embrace the territory. Second thing I know we need to do is focus on families. Focus on families. One of the great things about the life of the church is the Lord wants the church to be multi-generational. I quite often used to listen to senior adults. And they would, they would just have a spell when their youngins moved from town and went to Atlanta or Jacksonville. They'd come to class and they'd be talking about, oh man, you won't believe what kind of church they joined. They got this, 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 and this. That church pays attention to families. They got this great kids program. But then I'd think about some of them last business meetings. When if you wanted to do something creative, they didn't want to do it. But it was great if it was happening over yonder. Friend, let me tell you something. The way to change the generation... Is with the good news of Jesus. Amen. Don't ever think that there's some that don't need to be here. It's just from my heart. Focus on families. Enlarge our faith, Lord. You know, that's one of the two requests that I can remember that the disciples asked Jesus for. One of them must teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. The second one was and is, uh, they said, Lord, increase our faith. You know, I don't care if I don't ever have enough faith to move a mountain. But I sure want enough to help change a life. Amen. Friend, let me tell you something about our faith. Jerry Vines, I think, is the one who, who used to say it. He said, faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. A lot of saying there, is there not? Quickly, expect greater things. John 14 and 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Hey, are you expecting great things? Oh, Lord, we down in this rut. We won't ever get out of this rut we've got ourselves in. Lord, I tell you, just, just get us through it. No, God wants to do greater things. I would love to have the vision to see where God's going to have this body of Christ 10 years from now. I'd love to have it. But you want me to tell you what I'd rather have right now? To see where you'll be five months from now. Why? Because God is able. A lot of empty pews around us. Not totally empty, but you know what I'm saying. If I thought God couldn't do it, I'd leave today. But God is able. I have more to say, but let me just close with this thought this morning. John chapter 3 and verse 30 said, John the Baptist speaking, he said, He must increase being Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. The littler we get, the bigger we allow God to be. Friend, it's not about me. But I don't want to pop your bubble. It's not about you totally either. It is about Jesus. As you bow your head with me this morning.
It may seem that I've rambled a little bit, but I have. Why? Because the Lord said, cast a little vision. Expect things greater. Become less than you are. Glorify God in all we do and say. Don't believe people when they come in the door, don't pay attention. They do, and within the first three to five minutes, they have already determined if they'll come back or not. Let's make them so welcome. Exalt the Lord in such a way that they couldn't resist. Father, I am very grateful of the place you have put us. No doubt about where we are. But I'm also grateful because, Lord, you put us among a people that love you. But Lord, even as we're at the right place with the right people, that's not going to get the job done. Because, Lord, we have to go along with you and beside of you. Lord, you're great. You're trustworthy. You're dependable. You're honest. Lord, I'm believing that you're going to do more than we've even dreamed. Lord, touch every life as we leave this place today. May you be honored, glorified. Lord, show yourself mighty above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hey.